to do as well. Um, just want to mention that we have uh, four presenters today, and I'll be just in introducing who they are uh, in a moment. Because uh, we have four speakers and we want to make sure that they all have a chance to uh, speak to us, I'll invite you, um, if a question arises for you during one of their uh, one of, one of their presentations to please type it into the chat right away. Uh, and that will provide us the basis uh, to begin some question and answer uh, time together towards the end. We won't, we'll make sure we come back to the chat. So um, we won't lose your, we don't won't lose your question. So please be welcome to do that. And we'll actually take just a 30 second pause after each presentation to give you time to type in any questions as you need. So, be, but before I present our four and then um, invite them to speak one by one, um, I want to offer uh, an acknowledgement on whose land it is we live and work. We recognize that our work and daily life takes place on Indigenous territories across Canada. We also wish to acknowledge that the PWRDF office is located on the Indigenous territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful to be present here and commit ourselves to seeking truth and working towards reconciliation. Our four presenters, I'm just going to tell you who they are, and then they will introduce themselves when they make their presentations. Our four are our colleague Jose Sarate, who is the Indigenous Communities and Latin America Caribbean Development Program Coordinator here at PWRDF. Our, um, our Executive Director, Will Postma, is also with us. And we have two partners who will be speaking with us today. You may have seen advertised that the Reverend Lori Calkins was going to be joining us from Edmonton. Unfortunately, she's had a last minute emergency and could, uh, could not join us. And so uh, Lisa Phillips, bless her heart, um, at the very last minute, kindly agreed to join us and speak with us. Lisa is the executive director of the Core Language and Cultural Center at Ganawagi in Mohawk Territory. Um, thank you so much for stepping in, Lisa. It's great to have you with us. And finally, uh, Frida Lapine, who is with the Indigenous Peoples Alliance of Manitoba North, uh, known as IPAMN. And uh, Frida is also a member of the PWRDF Indigenous Advisory Committee, which we're going to learn a bit more about today as well. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Jose and Will uh, to begin our time together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Well, um, what a way to start. Huh? Uh, so I'm glad, very grateful that uh, Lisa was able to join us. Uh, we are going to start uh, this uh, just to want to uh, underline uh, how I see, foresee this event. This is a, an event um, to share good news. Um, how this uh, partnership with Indigenous Committee has been developed through the years and how this new uh, funding initiative, the Responsive Program works. Um, I am very grateful. Um, uh, my colleague uh, Will Posma will uh, we work on this presentation, and he will start with that. And then at the end of that, I will um, give some reflections about this recent meeting that uh, the Indigenous Program Advisory Committee uh, has met uh, this past week. And then we will follow with the program that we have. So um, I will uh, invite Will. Will, please. Jose, thanks so very much. Uh, Suzanne, thanks as well. And, and to everyone, it's really good to uh, be here uh, with all of you. It's great to see the flowers behind you, Suzanne, but there's lots of flowers out there and 
when we talk of a summer break, uh, that sounds just so wonderful. So, but still, it's good to be here at the end of the day on Tuesday. And I'm really glad to be able to share a little bit uh, about our Indigenous Program Advisory Committee. Maybe I can ask Janice if you can just share our first slide. I'll just walk through these quickly. I'm really glad that Frida is here with us. Monica McKay is here with us also on our Indigenous Program Advisory Committee and others as well. So um, just to situate it a little bit, um, we have been partnering with Indigenous communities and organizations for quite some time, since 1996. So about 25 into our 26th year. So we have been working, learning with Indigenous communities for quite some time. Um, Respect, respect for human rights has always been a part of our work with Indigenous communities and organizations, and it's helped inform programs on language, culture, health, water, just to name a few. Um, in our 15th year, there was an Indigenous Partners Roundtable in Alberta. I believe uh, Monica was there and maybe others of us were there as well, but that was really a seminal event reaffirming the importance of our work with Indigenous communities and that the program responds to needs and priorities of Indigenous communities. Um, yeah, next slide. In 2019, April 2019, a new five-year strategic plan began. And one of its goals said very clearly, specifically to accompany and support First Nations Métis and Inuit people on our mutual path of reconciliation. One of five uh, goals in our plan. This is our current plan continuing up to 2024. In 2020, there were terms of reference for an Indigenous Program Advisory Committee with Jose, but with others of staff and board, we felt it would be really good to work with a committee of Indigenous leaders, elders, to help us go forward in good ways. And the terms of reference were there to uh, provide support, or at least the terms of reference said, how can this committee provide support to PWRDF staff as it coordinates partnerships mm -hmm. and programs with Indigenous communities and advancing the implementation of that specific goal? <laughs> Next slide, please. So initially, uh, this was in 2020, uh, the composition of IPAC was set as follows. A representative from ASIP, that's the Anglican Council of Indigenous Peoples. Um, they have a representative on our board uh, as PWRDF. So they, uh, that person has joined. Uh, Dorothy Russell Patterson is that ASIP representative today. Um, the composition would also include another representative as nominated by ASIP. Uh, so a second, uh, a second uh, nominee. Uh, Frida is nominated by ASIP to join uh, our IPAC, and then two representatives from the broader Indigenous community in Canada. Monica, who's here, is one of those. So it was meant to be a small uh, uh, committee to help us go forward. In addition to us as staff, myself, my position, as well as uh, an additional staff with direct responsibilities, as is Jose, for programming in and with Indigenous communities. Going forward, however, uh, we're increasing membership with more representatives. Uh, we feel that's important, but also our board chair and our director of programs and partnerships, Patricia is here with us this afternoon as well, but just to recognize the importance of IPAC also at our board level. And it's really good that our board chair, Valerie Mayer has also joined and is a part, an important part of IPAC. The next slide. So responsibilities, just to go through these real quickly. Um, and they continue as follows, to assist in increasing awareness and education of Indigenous partners' journeys towards healing and well-being of their communities and their partnership with PWRDF aimed at reconciliation. Support staff in setting the direction and priorities for the Indigenous program delivery, including analysis of impacts towards reaching the goal to accompany and support First Nations, Métis and Inuit people on our mutual path of reconciliation. Responsibilities included to review means by which existing criteria and application templates for funding are shared and suggest opportunities by which to increase awareness and accessibility of these templates. So really good that IPIC, IPAC has supported us to make those templates simpler and clearer. And just in a more recent meeting last week, other good suggestions to make those templates as good and as effective 
and as clear and helpful for those who wish to respond. <laughs> Another responsibility to assist in identifying funding sources, as well as other agencies with which we may wish to collaborate and innovate. Water First, for example, is one example, but there are many others with which uh, we can um, do some really good work together and learn together. Promote collaboration of PWRDF with other initiatives of the Anglican Church of Canada and with other ecumenical development and academic bodies. Really great suggestions have been offered to date and to promote gender equality and programming and collaboration. How important that is for all of our programs in Canada and around the world. Next slide, Janice, please. So a first meeting of IPAC took place in March, 2020. Now we know March, 2020 as when the pandemic began. So we have not met in person until just last week when IPAC members uh, met at uh, Six Nations of the Grand River. At successive meetings, IPAC members, again, during the pandemic uh, over Zoom, supported the development of a responsive grants mechanism to complement longer term programs. So um, this was set up to respond quickly with grants of $5,000, $10,000, $15,000 of support for safe water, youth engagement, community health, and or climate action. So we had these four categories that we developed also with the advisory support of IPAC members to say all of these are really important. All of these could respond to priorities. And let's listen to others who come to us with requests for support in this particular mechanism. And again, a mechanism that complements our overall longer term strategic work uh, with Indigenous communities today. IPAC today continues to support and advise PWRDF to respond to Indigenous led priorities. So I think that's the last slide, uh, Janice. So um, we can end that. And uh, I'll turn it back to Suzanne. Um, really grateful that we have uh, Frida here as an IPAC member who can share some important work that they're doing. So Suzanne, thanks. Thanks so much, Will. And actually, um, Jose, were you going to um, speak yes. a bit more yeah. to Thank what you. Will Thank started? You. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes. B very briefly, um, thank you, Will. Uh, what I want to share with you is the, uh, about this uh, event that we had in Six Nations. Um, first of all, I, I really have to acknowledge, recognize that each member of the IPAC, the uh, advisory committee, are uh, people very committed, very knowledgeable, very in touch with, with people that I represent. They have been working from a uh, few decades in their own organizations with their own leaderships and also with a different level of governments. Um, I hear people from uh, uh, the Tlisha Nation, for instance. I hear people from uh, members from uh, Manitoba, two different uh, locations. And you are going to hear uh, later to Frida. Uh, I hear a uh, uh, representative from Six Nations. Uh, where we visited uh, uh, communities, uh, organizations, and we learned so much from them. I, I hear from uh, partners from um, uh, um, Nishka community, um, uh, Monica, who is now here uh, as part of the audience. So uh, we learned so much in those uh, few days. Um, it, it is, uh, uh, I will say there is, uh, we, we feel blessed to have this, uh, this uh, um, members of the committee that uh, are there to advise us, to guide us. Um, the, the, the issues, the, the topic that they raise during this conversation um, mirrors what we listened through the years uh, when we visited face-to-face -face communities, issues of youth, issues of women, issues of uh, addictions, issues of uh, um, mining, uh, uh, um, impacts, environmental impacts, the, the hydro, hydro Manitoba, for instance, we hear about the elders, uh, we hear about residential schools, we hear all those issues that uh, are current as it happened uh, years back when we started with this program. Um, I think the, this uh, good news that uh, today we're sharing is it gives us an instrument to uh, respond quickly to, to these uh, emergencies that uh, our partners introduced to us. And that's the best way um, with these grants from five to 
fifteen thousands, they can able the partners are able to implement right away to give solution to give response to to those emergencies to those uh, priorities identified by the communities. Um, in terms of uh, speakers uh, at this point, uh, I would like to ask Frida. Uh, Frida was uh, with us in, the, in this rehearsal session that we had last week. So, uh, and then after Frida, I will ask uh, uh, Lisa, the uh, person that I really appreciate that at the last minute accept this invitation. So Frida, could you please join us and, and give you an introduction who you are, please. Oh, you're on mute, Frida. Sorry. Okay, can you hear me now? Hey, thank you for letting me be part of this webinar. Um, it was kind of exciting when I got asked to be part of it um, and to share some of the things that we have been doing. I will first of all start off with introducing myself. I'm a mother of three, two boys, one girl, and eight grandchildren. Um, I've lived in Northern Manitoba most of the time. I've also lived in Dryden, Ontario, and Edmonton. But while in Northern Manitoba, I worked for the province, and I worked with 19 communities off reserve. Um, these communities were called local government development and were headed by the province. Anyway, in 1996, I think, I think it was 96, I retired. And I saw this job ad saying six weeks, six week um, uh, term position with uh, Manitoba Kiwet Nawiogimaganak. And now Manitoba Kiwet Nawiogimaganak is the Northern Chiefs. And these ones represent 23 First Nations on reserve, on reserve. So I worked with them. Uh, first of all, I worked with the repatriation program uh, with all the 60 spook children and teaching um, social workers how to reunite uh, the children properly when they come from Texas and from Germany and from England and wherever else we were finding them. So I worked with that program for eight years until it ran out. And then from there, I switched to employment and training. It was called First Nations Employment and Training. And um, I worked a lot with uh, partnerships, trying to find jobs for uh, youth coming off the reserves and things like that, helping them find places to stay. After I finished FNET, I started working as a partnership development coordinator under the ISETS program. And we developed um, programs such as the Ranger program, which was a 24 seven, eight, eight week program in the summer, a commuter program, which was another eight week program in the summer. And those, uh, that commuter program was bringing kids from hundred kilometers away every morning to get on a bus, come to work in Thompson. The bus would pick them up at four o'clock, take them back to their home community. We did that on purpose because we wanted them to realize what, um, you know, what it was to be able to work away from home and still, still be at home. So um, with that, the other program we developed was the apprenticeship program. And out of the 32 uh, apprentices that we started with, we ended up, I think 27 received their red seals. So we had heavy duty mechanics, we had electricians, we had um, steam fitter, pipe fitters, people like that. And then over and above that, I was also a volunteer and did a whole bunch of uh, FASD workshops in the communities. Some people had never even heard of what FASD was about. I've done a lot of volunteer work with our local church, both uh, within the diocese and within the parish. I've also done some work on midwifery, which I will elaborate on a little bit later. And then I was with the Aboriginal women in the North and most recently became involved in the uh, IPAM, which is Indigenous Peoples Alliance of Manitoba. So that's me in a nutshell. Um, I think um, 
I want to start with um, giving you a little overview of some of the programs we've been involved involved in. And I think one of the my favorites is how we were so quickly able to get this program together when when um, when the COVID hit the north. Like COVID hit didn't hit the north right away. Um, it was in January of 22 that COVID and Omicron became a critical health issue in, in uh, Northern Manitoba. Many people had gotten COVID and were getting the Omicron virus. People had been vaccinated and those non-vaccinated were being recorded as having the virus and it was spreading from one community to the other quickly. Nursing stations, frontline workers and first responders were being overwhelmed and the ICUs were filled to capacity. Many of our communities went into lockdown. We, we saw that gap right away in our communities because most of our communities did not qualify for First Nation assistance because they were off reserve. As many of them being off reserve and living in settlements and or communities, some living in the city of Thompson and other urban centers. Many families were placed into isolation and sent to Thompson hotel rooms to isolate, not giving them time to even pack a few toys for their children and other items that to keep their children occupied in these, in these hotel rooms. It was then PWRF stepped in and with the Indigenous Peoples Alliance of Manitoba North, which is based out of Oboden, Manitoba, responded and we ended up, we made a budget for the 11 communities that we saw the most need in, and we submitted it and we got the gift agreement. Um, then the, the Indigenous Peoples Alliance of Manitoba is a Northern, um, the Northern part of the Indigenous Peoples Alliance Manitoba. IPAM is a Manitoba group associated with the Co Congress of Aboriginal Peoples Canada. The Pe Indigenous Peoples Alliance of Manitoba is a collective voice representing, preserving, and promoting the heritage, culture, languages, and rights of all Indigenous peoples in Manitoba. We work together inclusively and respectively to represent the interests of all Métis, First Nations, Inuit, I forgot to add in there, Dene, non-status and off-reserve peoples who identify as indigenous in these areas of the province. <clears throat> the communities we served were, there was 11 of them and then in the North, including the city of Thompson. IPAM purchased supplies and distributed to the affected communities, the agreed products such as masks, hand sanitizer, soap, Javix, laundry soap, garbage bags, paper towels, paper, toilet paper, and other cleaning supplies. And the reason for that was those were the supplies that people were going through like crazy because they were trying to keep their houses clean and things like that. But those are also very expensive items in their communities. <clears throat> so we purchased those in urban centers and then we delivered it to them. In a few areas, we had to deliver some grocery hampers for the needy and people on fixed items. With each community, we found it easier to come to supply, um, go four of us at a time with two carts each, fill up those carts, pay for it, divide, get home and divide all those supplies into boxes for each individual family. <clears throat> Some were delivered by Winter Road, regular road, CN Railway, airlines. Once we got to the communities, quads, snowmobiles, local trucks, and vehicles took over. Over 8,680 kilometers were traveled to get the supplies to the communities. And that's just one vehicle. There were three or four others sometimes. Once the supplies were delivered to the community, local volunteers delivered to the home delivered them to the homes. One community didn't even have a gas station. The nearest one was 110 kilometers away. Therefore, they had no access to a grocery store as there was no grocery store in their community, in their home community. 
And there's about 95 people that live in that little community. It used to be a gold mine years and years ago. So that just shows gold mines just up and leave and nothing's left. So what we did with this COVID project, the activities we completed where we were able to identify by community and secure volunteers and helpers to meet us at the distribution point. We were able to pick up, do the shopping, deliver to a central site, repack, and then load into a half ton of van or a delivery to all the homes. It took a lot of time and commitment. Numerous calls, text messages, and even using the local radio station for people to let them know the supplies were in. We had to, we had to negotiate uh, prices on masks in the city of Winnipeg uh, and hand sanitizers. We went to about five different companies and found out which ones had the, the best products and, and got cases from them. And we didn't go without challenges. The challenges we re re encountered were of course the increased gas prices. They were going up and up and up. We had limited volunteers. Storage space was a big one. We needed a heated building so the supplies we were purchasing would not freeze. We were encountering deep freeze conditions during this time, which was December to March. And it was like minus 30, minus 35, minus 40, but we still loaded up our vans and away we went. And then there was even shortage of supplies in the big stores such as Walmart and places like that. So like sometimes we go to Walmart, the shelves would be all empty because the people from the communities, the ones that were able to travel, were emptying them. The freight costs were going way up. So that was another big issue. But we made it and we got them all delivered. So the other one, the other program I'd like to touch on is the midwifery program. That was one of our first partnerships with PWRF in 2005. We did midwifery consultations throughout Northern Manitoba, interviewing and documenting elder midwives that had no longer been allowed to practice midwifery, research on the history of Aboriginal practices of midwifery. At first, they didn't even want to talk to us, especially the elders. They said, no, no, don't, don't say anything because you'll get in trouble, you'll go to jail until we, we uh, reassured them that no, no, this was being, um, we were recording all this because we were trying to get the program going again. <clears throat> we concluded the consultations with an honoring ceremony of 53 midwives who had been told they could no longer practice midwife. This document is available if anyone wants to see more information on it. It was honorees, it was a celebration of past midwives and those still living was done with a traditional feast, honoring ceremony with youth performing, jingle dress dancers, jigging, and then we did a giveaway. The 53 midwives received a certificate of thanks from the service that they had done from the then, then Minister of Health for the province of Manitoba, the Honorable Kim Sale. They were also presented with shawls, so it was very, heartwarming to see this. Many guest speakers and many family members were on hand to congratulate them for the work they had done. <clears throat> the other thing we did um, as IPAM members was we had summer camps. Uh, again, with the help of PWDRF and some other local like RCMP conservation officers and people like that, we applied for a grant uh, from PWRF and received to have a day camp. We initially thought we'd have 15 to 20 youth, but lo and behold, we ended up with 52 participants and 15 volunteers. The camp started off each day with opening prayers, traditional teachings, the seven teachings were taught one for each day. And we also included where they could find those seven teachings in the Bible. So they could go home and tell their mom and dad, these seven teachings are in the Bible. Participants were then broken into groups and sent to various breakout groups. Some of them went and picked wildflowers, um, trees, like uh, different parts of the tree, barks and leaves and whatever tree could be used for medicine. 
Some of them did cupcake decorating. Some of them learned how to smoke fish and how to identify these fish and how to prepare them. So like uh, you think, well, they live in the North, they should know how to fish, but no. A lot of our children have never been able, have not had the opportunity to go out fishing and, um, and uh, be able to see what the fish, what kind of fish there was in the lake. They also picked medicines and um, things like mint tea, Labrador tea and stuff like that. That camp ended with a community feast where we asked the children to bring their families. Well, over a hundred people showed up and attended the feast. The participants got to show off their crafts they had created, the pictures they did, the teachings they learned, and the adults got to feast on smoked fish, fried pickerel, moose meat, bannock, and other foods. And the adults also brought like big roasting pans full of potato salad and hot dogs for the kids, all kinds of stuff. So it was really a feast. <clears throat> that was that program. And because of COVID, we used to have summer camps before COVID. We used to have summer camps and they were for a week long. But Cross Lake, one of our communities, got creative. <coughs> they said um, the community hadn't been able to do their summer camp or their annual camp out for several years. So they decided they would do it. They held it in the first week of July, three miles out of the community. The ca families camped for a week. In 2021, they had been in their bubble for about a year. So they decided to do backyard camping and still keep in the bubble. They did different activities and they had to regi register for these activities because it was harder to monitor because you had to go from, like, um, from this person's yard to the next person's yard, that type thing, for the backyard to see what they were doing. So they made bannock by the fire. They, um, they had prizes registered for the partnership for, by the community and other organizations. And the fun week was a success for the families. Uh, some of the things they did, rock painting, art contests, Tootsie contest, birdhouse, homemade birdhouse, window painting contest, bannock baking contest, best hair braid contest, square dances, TikTok video, lying contest, <laughs> and some made slingshots. So again, that was thanks to IPAM and partnering with the communities to be able to do it. The last one I'd like to be able to talk a little bit about is the missing and murdered indigenous women. CAP, Congress of Aboriginal People provided us 15,000 to identify priorities in CAP's um, development of the MMIWG National Action Plan. IPAM North did the workshop with 23 women and three men affected by the MMIWG. We had um, nine communities present and 26 people. And we went through the recommendations that were made and made our own recommendations on how to assist local women who are isolated from services that, they, that are provided to others down south. <clears throat> the, the, the seven areas we touched on were health and wellness, human, human trafficking and sexual exploitation, human security. And then there was number two was human and indigenous rights government obligations, distinct based, distinction based. The third one was justice, police services, correction services. The fourth one was 2SLGBTQQIA and culture. The fourth one was media and social influences, education and calls for action. The sixth one was child welfare. The seventh one, was extractive and development industries regarding like hydro mining forestry. And some of these we, we spoke about at the IPAC meeting because we see that some of those could be brought forward for follow-up and with the help of IPAC, maybe get some more so we can follow up on them. So that pretty well covers up what um, 
what we have done, but I just want to point out one more thing. <laughs> the Indigenous Ad Program Advisory Committee, um, IPAC, we guided the program throughout. Like um, we said, the program for one thing had, it was too difficult, like too much detail in the, in the application. Some of our Northern communities don't have access to all, like to, for somebody to help them write up a proposal. So we said, we have to make it simpler. And, um, and, and that they did, they followed up on that. We said we needed to, it be more accessible and maybe even hard copies sent to our, some of our communities. As a matter of fact, this past week, I was supposed to be at a meeting in Brandon where all our um, diocesan uh, communities were. And I asked our uh, Greg, who is our uh, Bishop's executive assistant, if he could download the application and make some hard copies for our communities so that they would all go home with an application. And he said he would do that. Not all communities have access to computers. How will they connect in a webinar? Like a lot of our communities only have high-speed internet at the RCMP, the conservation officers, hydro, or the school. And the rest of the people have to wait for dial-up and whatnot. So again, I was recommending that hard copies be made available to our communities and parishes. The webinar is for info sharing, and I'm sure like um, not all of them will get to see it. Internet costs in the North are over $150 a month. So people on fixed income cannot afford it. So we got to remember all these things. And um, another big one is a charitable number. Like they always ask for a charitable number no matter where we go to apply for a grant. And then charitable numbers need an audit Auditors in the North, there's maybe three companies that cover the whole North, which is 27 communities, 27 First Nations and 19 communities. So it takes forever to try to get an audit then. And then like the other thing is, if you've got a $10,000 grant, you don't wanna be paying $3,000 for an audit, um, like because that $3,000 could be going to the, to the children that need it, the families that need it. That's how we look at it. So I want, I just wanted to make sure that IPAC and the other people were aware of that. Um, yeah, the, the program was supposed to, was developed to enable indigenous led communities to apply for support for safe water, youth engagement, community health and or climate change. And it's supposed to enhance and, and uh, continue our relationships and partners and help us learn what other indigenous organizations are doing across the country. But like I said, you got to remember all these other things I mentioned. It, it may not be as easily as it's as we think it's going to be. Um, we got to keep remembering that we got to help those communities that don't have access to laptops or printers or whatever. Like the nearest, like some of the communities, the nearest printer, they got to go to the band office or they got to go to the community council office, places like that to get stuff printed off. So that's um, my presentation in a nutshell. I hope I didn't make it too long. That was wonderful, and Frida. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for so listening. Much. Yeah. Thank you so much. And there, there was a lot in that, I think, um, both in terms of what's been happening most recently, but also the history of our relationship with, with you and with IPAM. And so thank you yes. for setting that context. And I think also, thank you for reminding us of some of the, the challenges that, um, that, that Northern communities face just technologically and in so many ways. So thank you very much for that. I'm going to, I've had a request um, that we take, uh, I mentioned a 30 second pause for people to put questions in the chat. I've also been asked for a 30 second stretch because it's sleepy time in the afternoon. Nothing to do with Frida or any of the presentations, just it's that time of day. So if you need to take a stretch, please do. If that means standing up, please do that. And, uh, but don't go far because it's 30 Would seconds. Would Frida like to tell, offer to win the line? <laughs> yes. 
I'll have to ask Darlene that one. <laughs> <laughs> Who is a champion liar? Mm -hmm. um, and if you do have a question that you um, want to get in the chat, please put it there and we will come back to them um, after we hear from, from Lisa. So um, I think that's 30 seconds, give or take. And so I'm going to um, pass over to Lisa to, and Lisa, I invite you to introduce yourself as, as you wish and offer a word about the core um, program. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, welcome everybody and thank you for uh, having me speak today. Um, I'm always very uh, uh, I can't even think now because it is like that three o'clock time where I start to go like this. Um, but I'm always honored when uh, Jose asks me to speak for anything and always willing and, and make myself available. Um, just because our relationship with PWRDF goes very far back. I can't even off the top of my head, I would say it's at least, I would think 13 to 15 years that we've had the relationship with PWRDF. I've been working, I'm the executive director of, of KOR Language and Cultural Center. Um, I've been working for them for uh, 22 years. So I'm the longest standing employee now at KOR. So I was first uh, working within the organization when Jose and that relationship with PWRDF uh, was initiated and, and had begun. So whenever he asks me to speak or for any help whatsoever, I, I'm always willing to oblige. I know I've done some, I, I've met some of you previously, maybe just a month ago doing a presentation for uh, the Montreal uh, office, I believe. Um, I've done some where I've gone to Ontario, you know, and attended a service and done a presentation as well there. So uh, I was never a, a, a good public speaker, but I'm, I'm learning to, to become so through these different uh, speaking engagements. So I just wanna thank you. And what I'm gonna do is I am going to share my screen if I can. Uh, let me see. Okay, I'm gonna do it, hold on. Here we go. Okay, so everybody can see this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so this was a presentation that I did uh, just last month. But again, I just wanted to say that we've had a long standing relationship with uh, PWRDF and with Jose Zarati. And Will as well, Postma has been uh, to visit us on site. Uh, we had some visits. Um, this past year, we we received funding through the through the response uh, the responsive um, program. And so uh, I like to thank Frida for her talk and for the different items that she uh, spoke about. And as I'm listening to them, I'm going, oh my God, like ours doesn't sound as good as hers. But at the <laughs> end of the day, um, what we have to remember is that the diversity of First Nations, Indigenous people, you know, there's, there's it's very diverse as are their priorities and their needs. So it could be different, right? For every community, it could be clean water. Uh, we have the good fortune that that's not one of the cases for us. Um, but for here, what, what our priority is, is, the, is our language and our culture and the revitalization. I've attended the many different seminars, conferences, workshops uh, with indigenous people. And some you know, are in the fortunate position that you know, the majority of their communities are speakers. Most of them tend to be more remote uh, communities. And if I were to, I don't know if I could kind of show you, maybe I can outside my office and you see the Mercier Bridge right there, we're completely surrounded um, our community. Um, you know, Montreal is just 15 minutes, you know, from here. Uh, we have Shadagi, we have Longale, we have the South Shore. So we're completely, completely within that. So that close proximity, you know, offers us a lot of opportunities, but it also offers those opportunities to be, uh, of course, number one loss of language in our culture. Um, 
we do have community members here, um, you know, when we hear, when we talk about Indian days, uh, I'm sorry about residential school, we have some residential school survivors here, but one thing that our community was, uh, you know, completely underwent was Indian day schools, similar to residential, you don't, you got to stay home, but it was still that same system. So um, with that became the, you know, was the first loss of language and culture on us. So that's what one of our priorities are, which is supported by our, our band council and their, their uh, priorities that they set out uh, for the three year, year term that they're in currently, they're just finishing their first year. And that was for um, supporting uh, the building, the construction of a new multi-purpose building, which would house the cultural yeah. center and the museum as well as a theater because we have always been, you know, as a grassroots group and a nonprofit, we were always um, located within uh, very, very old buildings. The last building we were in was condemned for quite a few years. So we've never been located within a, a, a decent location. So we've since moved into a temporary location uh, that MCK allowed for us. And we just received funding as of late for the construction of our new building. Um, so that's one of the main uh, priorities, actually the number one priority of our band council, as well as language and culture initiatives. Um, we're also supported by the Gunawage Collective Impact, where the number two priority, two out of three, pri um, there were three top priorities, and the number uh, two priority was language and culture again. So that's our reality here because I think it was just prior to the pandemic, we hosted an event here where we identified all of our first language speakers within the community. And I believe we only had about 200, approximately 200 speakers out of 8,000 people. So our numbers are very, very low in terms of our elders and our first language speakers. And um, the language revitalization efforts now within the community rest largely on the shoulders uh, of second language speakers. So of course that changes the landscape, landscape of speaking as well. So um, these are the initiatives, the core programs uh, that we do within uh, our <laughs> community, which is the Ganyigeha Radiwana Nirats program, our Dada Gwardi puppet show, public programming, whether it's annual or, or cultural uh, programming. And then we also have a photo archives a radio show, which is all in the language. And we have audio archives that date back to, I believe, 1992 uh, that we have uh, and we're transcribing as well. And then we have a library, library which is a specialized library um, on the Mohawk specifically and the Iroquois Confederacy at large. So this is uh, what we do here. Um, and so for, for us, for, for this particular funding of the emergency response, it was aimed at community health and youth engagement. Um, our Vlorati Wunenirdats program is an adult immersion program. It's two years and 36 weeks per year. They attend Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 3.30 and a class size is generally 15 to 16 students. Mm -hmm. Um, and it goes from any age of 17 plus. Like you can have a 17 year old and you can have a 60 year old. So it, it, it varies our class size. Um, we're entering our 20th year, which we were just talking about today in September, this coming September, it'll be the 20th anniversary of that program. We've graduated over 170 students who are employed now throughout the community and they work in the field of radio, television, communications, community orgs, but most specifically as teachers. The minute they come out because they have language, they're sought, highly sought within the community schools. We have uh, three schools that are underneath the education system. Uh, two are elementary schools, but one of those is an, an, immersion pro, uh, an immersion school in the language, and then we have the high school. But additionally, we have other uh, two elementary schools that are not within that system, uh, and one of them is a language immersion program as well. So they're very really highly sought after. Um, the goals of, of our program are to provide a creative, engaging, and culturally rich experience, fostering the continuous advancement of our language, spoken language proficiency, and to empower the community to participate and contribute to the maintenance of vitality of Nguyen Nguyeneha, our language. Um, what we see here, you know, 
uh, especially with the Indian day schools, with the residential schools and that loss of language and culture is that for our community identity, which of course is tied to language and culture is what's a priority for our community. Um, seeing those 170 plus students graduate from the program, it, uh, there's no feeling like it. Um, I'm also a graduate of the program too. I was in year four. Most of the staff here at, at the Cultural Center are graduates of the program, but I've seen people come and go and it's a life-changing program for everybody. Once you start to learn the language and you're able to understand it, um, able to speak it, but especially just to have been understanding it, it's, it changes everything. It changes the way you look at things, the way you understand things, but it also changes, um, you know, it empowers, it empowers you. And that's what's really needed in our community, you know, is that, is that identity, self-identity and, and knowing who you are and, and believing in that and having the strength and the growth that comes with, with the language and the culture. So that's very important to us and a priority. Um, so here, the program is just to provide the opportunity to increase your language proficiency as well as your comprehension through a variety of different methods and practical applications. Throughout the 20 years, the program has evolved and changed in many ways. Um, two of our teacher, two out of our four teachers are graduates of the program. Um, we've had numerous teachers throughout the history, some were elders and first language speakers. Uh, we had a linguist, it, it constantly changes and grows. We're always looking at best uh, practices in teaching. Uh, two of my teachers are gonna be graduating with their bachelors of education. I think they're done today. I have another with, who is gonna be graduating with a master's in language revitalization. Education, however, is not necessarily a requirement for our teachers, it's the speaking. You know, and just because you can speak doesn't mean you can teach. So um, it's very hard to find good teachers uh, for this program. So part of this emergency preparedness too, where you're looking at youth engagement and community health, which are tied to the language and culture, the approach that we were looking at within this proposal uh, for this funding was looking at succession planning and capacity building and also uh, the building of resources because one thing that we know or, or that we, yeah, that we know within our language is that the resources are very, very limited. So you have to create your own resources. But what we're looking at is trying to um, address several problems, you know, or several issues, tackle them and, and solve them um, in, uh, together. So through succession planning, what we need to do is we need to create more people who have this skill set and the experience um, and the specialization that our teachers that we have now have. But we also have to look at the teachers that we have and enabling them within their own development to continue to go up. Because as we lose our first language speakers, it, it, it's going to become harder for us. So what we're looking at, the approach is to utilize our graduates, bring them in and have them work within the organization, within the programming. If they have particular skills teaching it to our students, even our teachers, where they're land-based teachings, but within the language, and then creating that succession, you know, the skills for, for our, our, the people, our students, our teachers and whatnot. So that's the approach that we're going with. And just understanding as well within that our cultural teachings and our arts delivered in the context of language. And then there's a huge emphasis on uh, the linguists, the linguistics of it and the grammatical structures in orthography. So not only will they be able to speak, but they'll have, you know, the capacity and the capabilities to be able to read and write it. Um, and then of course to increase speakers within our community because like I said it's it's every year you know the 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 numbers go down less and less it's very sad because I've been here 22 years and it's it's a sad thing so here they do hands-on student activities experiences and grammar lessons and our program is completely in the language so once the door closes there's no English spoken 
uh, in that program. And it's only a two year program and it's been very successful in being able to take uh, people and, and, and bringing them up in their proficiency level. We're not gonna say they're fluent because that's a whole other level that generally is reserved for first language speakers, but we follow the ACTAFIL um, uh, way of looking at proficiency, which is non-rateable, novice, intermediate, and superior within there in advance. And so that's what we utilize. So we all, for the most part, every student who comes into the program will increase by three or four proficiency levels. So they're coming out intermediate, high, or even advanced speakers, not superior, but that's something we're looking at again. And that's what we use. We use uh, so we use the benchmarks of the ACTAFIL, which is the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages. Uh, and that's what we use for that. So next is Duda Danuo Guardi, and this is another one of our most uh, identical projects, uh, programs within the Cultural Center. And I just like to say that um, PWRDF has been helping us throughout the years with these two programs, which are our most identifiable ones. We had a, a community fair one time in the community and all of the organizations went and people would come to our stand and, oh, okay, what does the Cultural Center do? Uh, well, we have this, we have that. Well, do you know the Dadanahwari? Yep. Do you know the Redwanir? It's of course. So there are two most identifiable projects um, of the organization. And for this, the Dadanahwari, it's, uh, it's puppets that were created in-house. Everything's done within in-house from script writing, uh, making of the puppets, costumes, everything, uh, editing, filming. And it's all done in the language and they're in their 18th year. So this program has been going for quite a while. Um, so to try to prevent us also from getting stagnant, you know, we're looking at different things that we can do and we're creating, uh, because mostly it was um, uh, like a television show that would be displayed on our local cable um, uh, station. And then we're also on YouTube, but we're branching out now to collaborations with the environment here and our health services. And all of the topics are health related, you know, and promoting healthy living and a healthy, uh, you know, in healthy well being, healthy lifestyles. But we've also expanded into the environment where we have a collaboration with the environment committee here. And we just produced a few books you know, on, on the local animals and local fish. So that's what we're looking for, but within a children's book format, you know, because children like books and, and that. So what we're doing there too, is trying to be, you know, twofold in our approach and looking at what is it that people that come here, you know, what are they asking for? You know, they're looking for language uh, material. They're looking for language resources. They're looking for things that they can teach their kids that can help also teach them if they have uh, an absence of language. So we're trying to put all of these things into one, you know, the healthy living, the environment, the language, and, 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 and what is being asked for. And yeah, so we're, I believe we're going into our 19th season for this, but Duda, this is Duda and Duda is grandmother and Oguardi is her grandson. And so they're the main characters. And then there's also Zitta, which is the cousin. And so, you know, the, the Duda, of course, has that wealth of knowledge of our ways, you know, in our language. So she te teaches that to her grandson. Um, and then here you'll see the the corn, uh, the corn, beans, and squash, which of course are our three sisters in our culture. So we have those puppets. There's other puppets as well, like a heart or a kidney or you know anything to show to to do with specific topics. We also use graduates of our adult immersion program to be the voices of the show um, or else children, you know, who have an interest in the show who are in language, in language, getting schooling in, in their in the language. We use that as well. We've even had a, a couple of episodes where we engaged youth within the community to, to be the script writers. And then um, our scripts are, all, and then translated by our elders. So it's quite a collaborative uh, uh, effort to do the Dadano Guardi. 
And we actually had a community barbecue on Friday. All of the organizations and the entire community were there. And we have life size to the Danua Gwari, and they're the original puppeteers. And so they were on site, you know, at, at the barbecue, and the kids were going crazy when they see them. So th that's our Dada Danua Gwari. And here you just see different scenes from that, what they do. But it's, it's also on um, K103, which is our radio program on our uh, community channel. Uh, cable channel and as well on on YouTube. So here again, like I had just stated, you know, we're 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 looking at fostering proficiency, but also to address health issues, mental wellness, chronic disease, diabetes is something that's very prevalent in our community. But also, you know, increase that collective pride again, which is tied to our culture, history, and identity, um, which is a protective factor. Uh, for for us as a people against depression and suicide. And then it's also, uh, it crosses the generations. You know, it pulls the generations together um, in terms of, you know, like the children, the parents, the grandparents, the elders who help us. So that's our Duda Danawagwari. And you can always hear, you can watch it on YouTube. You can see some of our, our episodes. And then now we have public programming as well. So we have a variety. And again, all of our programming for the most part, I'm looking here, except for the last one, the Eastern Connection Film Festival, they're all done within the language. These are all language programs. Uh, so we have the Devojarunya, which unfortunately we haven't been able to do due to COVID, but I'm hoping this coming February, we always do it during the winter carnival, we'll be able to do it again. The winter carnival runs, I believe, for two weeks from our youth center. And this is our event that we do during that winter carnival. But it's also, also the most attended event during winter carnival. So that's like schools, um, our adult immersion program. We may have some people that come from our sister communities and they put on skits and dances and whatnot all in the language. So it's the most attended event during our winter carnival. And then we do always every April, uh, and that's our cultural awareness month. And that's a month long um, community wide uh, uh, event that we do. It's led by the cultural center. And within that month, we highlight language and culture and the entire community participates in that as well. Uh, especially the organizations and providing programming. That's where a lot of collaborations and partnerships take place. We do our weekly radio show, which is every Wednesday from 12 to 1, and we have our two elders, Joe, Dunn, and Leo, who do that. Uh, Joe, I believe, is 79. Leo is 83. <laughs> and they've been working for us for years. Again, because it's language, our first language, our uh, speakers are elders. We do have a lot of, uh, do a lot of work with our elders. And then we do twice yearly, we do a Christmas show and a Wata, which is maple show during cultural awareness month. And that one runs from nine to one. And our hosts are all of our, our elders and our first language speakers. And some of the schools come, we invite guests. And then we have a language gathering and a curriculum sale. And then coming up for the first time in three years due to COVID, uh, we're gonna be having our powwow will once again, once again be taking place. Um, but powwows are not um, indigenous to us as Mohawks. So the role of the cultural center, of course, is authenticity and promoting our culture. So what we do for powwow weekend is we do the annual Friday night traditional social, which highlights the social songs and the dances of the Mohawks because the powwow is not really ours. So we do that event. We do a lot. <laughs> a very small staff. So these are just some of the posters that we have showing all of the different things that we do. And then we also, of course, offer community and cultural classes. All of these things are not just, they're, they're again, tied to identity, tied to wanting people to learn, you know, the things that are, are, are to us. Here we have moccasins, you know, we teach moccasins using the Mohawk style. Uh, we've had basket making, we've had silver work, um, not just maybe moccasins, you know, like making of the traditional outfits, 
especially if we do it in the winter time, parents are wanting to begin to make their, their graduation outfits for their, you know, for their children, you know, their yokes and their cuffs and, and that. So we teach all of that. And so we have a photo archives as well, um, which has just come back to life after a long time. And we've taken a different approach to that. And uh, we've we started to offer restorations and the way we look at this and the way we approach our photo archives is that we reach out to the community um, to let us have access to their family photos we scan them we give them back but then we also collect the history so that's that oral you know oral history storytelling um, aspect again of our culture that allows us, you know, to share those stories and to document them. And that's really new one here. This I told you, my Joe Dunno Leo, who do our radio show. Uh, Leo, I believe, is 82. Joe is 79. And you have here the last hour, they always play music. They do jigging and play songs in, in Mohawk. And here they are as our uh, uh, our hosts. And you see all the elders here. Unfortunately, if I look around that table now, I think all but two are gone. Uh, my aunt, my great aunt, who is 92 years old, is luckily still with us. And she's one of our main elders that always comes around. She loves to dance. So once they start playing their jig music, she gets up to dance and she's 92 years old. So those are all of the things that we do. One story I have, which is always my favorite story. I don't know if you can see where I'm circling, but this man right here. I don't know if anybody ever heard of Billy Two Rivers but he was a professional wrestler back in the day. And now he's an, you know, he's an elder and he's in the hospital. Like his body took a lot of beating from well, wear and tear from them, his wrestling days with Don Eagle and that. But he came to, to, to do the show for us one day and he was sitting in a chair and a bus pulled up and the kids were from Aguazasne. And I don't know if you guys know where Aguazasne is from, but it's like Ontario and, and New York. And they got off the bus and they saw Billy and they were, oh my God, it's Billy Two Rivers. And they also, they, they went around him in a circle and they were talking the language back and forth. You know, these little school age children were so excited to meet Billy Two Rivers and he was talking to them. And it, those are one of my good memories, you know, from, from all of my years working with the cultural center. And I believe, I think that's, oh no. And then our library and museum. So we've moved right now temporarily and we have all of our books but some of our stuff we have to put in storage but we've already begun the work needed for the museum you know creating the the, the yeah, I can't think of the word our exhibits but also uh, looking at you know doing an inventory of all of our stuff that we have uh, deciding what needs to be repaired what can be restored you know what things we just might have to leave be uh, development of policies and that so there's a lot of work that we do here and then here we we started you know with our we do some uh, art exhibits some and this one was one that we just had our show exhibit and that took place in the fall and we had uh, people from all different communities contribute to that and yeah that's it for us so I do want to say that for the most part uh, especially with those two most identifiable projects, our programming that we do, our Kanyukehaura Divanir Adult Immersion Program and our Duda Danuwabwardi Show, as well as our cultural uh, and language um, initiatives. Uh, PWRDF has always been there, uh, has been a big supporter of us. Um, I like I've been working with Jose for many many years, uh, but. I'd also just like to say, uh, you know, hearing about, um, you know, the, the, the application process being simplified, that's a very good idea. I've had to fill out that sheet, I don't know how many times, and I do a lot of, of the reports. We always have to do an interim report, a final report. Um, we're very accountable for every single penny that we earn. Um, but we're extremely thankful to PWRDF and to Jose for all of, you know, the support that we've received over the years. Um, Jose, I believe I, we have each other on speed dial now. 
on our phones and he can call me and I can call him. He's always accessible. And he works with me because um, I started in this organization, you know, from the bottom and made my way up. And, and it's through, not really through formal education, but experience, um, you know, that the way I learned here, and he's helped me a lot in terms of, um, how do I say it? In terms of my applications and helping me or making suggestions, you know, and, and always available. And I, and I really appreciate that relationship. I know we also even used to fund, PWRDF used to fund Ohorogu too. I remember at what time there, I believe there was some extra money. They were looking for a project to fund. And I had this great idea of doing this rites of passage for young ladies. And so that was approved and, and we did that for a number of years as well. So um, I've always had a great relationship with PWRDF and like this, when Jose asks last minute, can you do it? Yes, I can. Or, uh, you know, anybody asks me to do something, I, I always do. I like to speak about our organization. I like to speak about the work that we do, you know, and the work that uh, PWRDF PWRDF has always helped us with. So now I'll go. I could always talk and go talk and talk. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, and for stepping in again at the last minute. I understand Frida is needing to leave shortly um, for a seven hour drive. Um, so Frida, do you have time to answer one question that I've seen in the chat or are you needing to go right now? Just need to unmute. Can you unmute Frida? There okay. we go. Which question was it? Just um, a question about um, the midwifery program now. What's what's happening with um, okay. work with midwives um, now? <clears throat> The midwifery program now is now being taught out of Winnipeg, University of Manitoba. We originally started it in the north and wanted it to stay in the north. We wanted our uh, we wanted our birth center in the north, but it all ended up down south. All political stuff. But um, but what we managed to do before everything went crazy on us, we were able to manage to put our committee, which is called. Ka which means always our grandchildren. We got that committee entrenched in the act, Manitoba act. So on under health. So they, they can't get rid of us <laughs> or they'd have a hard time getting rid of us because it is in the act, it's entrenched in the act. So that was one positive thing. So now, even though it's in Winnipeg, they still have to consult with us. And we are still working on trying to get the midwifery training done in the north or the birthing center. Because uh, I have uh, a cousin that took the midwifery training. She graduated and is now a midwife in Thompson. And she said, oh, she says, it's horrible. She said, sometimes our babies are born in the hallways. That's how busy it is. Like there's no, you know, they're born in the hallways. They're born in, you know, so it's uh, we're still struggling. We're still meeting like uh, KD. It's, we call it the KD committee, uh, not craft dinner. <laughs> but anyway, we call it the KD dinner and we um, <laughs> dinner, the KD committee. And we meet maybe usually twice a year. And then like when there's something special going on, the us I usually get an invite to it. Like if there's um, honoring ceremony or anything like that. So we're still very much involved and we're still very much part of the midwifery program. As a matter of fact, when I was in, uh, when I was at Six Nations there, we were touring the Six Nations midwifery building and I ran into about 10 or 12 women. And I, of course, I'm being nosy as, hi, are you girls from local? You know, are you local? No, 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 she says, we're from Australia. <laughs> I said, Australia, you're a long way from home. And they said, yeah. So we started chatting. Then they were asking me all kinds of questions about our program. So it was really, it was nice. Wonderful. Being able to That's good. chat with them. Yeah. And I, courage and strength to getting the midwifery um, mm -hmm. 
back into the communities because that's where it needs to be. Yeah, it? As but as like there's um, the community the other thing that we really got to watch out for is there's jurisdictional issues. Hmm. Indian Affairs will not let the women have their babies in their home if they're on a reserve. It's not allowed. So um, if they're off reserve, they can have the baby at home, like the off reserve communities. Um, but like there's all kinds of jurisdictional issues that that we have to deal with and bring to the forefront and get, you know, get our ministers to realize that these are not right. You know, if we're going to have midwifery in the north, let's have midwifery in the north, not in the hallways of the hospitals. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Can Thank I, you. you said that's Indian Affairs who says that? Yes. It's uh, apparently it's right in their Indian Affairs Act that you have to look because my cousin just had a baby. She's maybe nine months old and she had her baby at home. Yeah, but like up with a midwife. Yes, because at home they do not allow it. Yeah, we have quite a few midwives here, but she might have had somebody out. Well, there's doulas, right? There's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But she had her baby at home. We have quite a few girls who have their babies at home. Yeah. But that's something we're looking at here too in our community. I know the hospital about having a birthing center here so that mm -hmm. we can do it our way too, right? Because yeah, right exactly. now you have to go, you know, you yeah. can make the choice to have the baby at home. But then, of course, there's always risks attached. Yeah. And then you have the, the, the family there. You have the children yeah. there. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's long really gone. That. that was that was taken away from us years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Usually, some of our communities they send the, the woman out two months ahead of time. Like they'll take her out of like say Island Lake, they'll bring her to Winnipeg because they call her high risk. Uh -huh. So she has to live in Winnipeg by herself for the last two months of her pregnancy. Then she ends up having her baby all by herself, and then ends up going home like um, sometimes a week later. Like baby's already a week old by the time yeah. brothers and sisters and daddy can see her. Yeah. See, that's the thing, right? Again, about that diversity. And mm -hmm. and I don't even know, like my my experience, my lived experience is here, you know, in my community, which we're very, very close to the city mm -hmm. and, and all of these places, you know, but I know some places are very remote like that where mm -hmm. You know that's what's going to happen, and it's sad that it has the to. The communities, yeah. If you're if you're close to a city, you're fine because yeah. But if you're like up way up where we are, um, some of the communities are three four hundred kilometers away from Thompson. They have to fly in. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Some of them have to go to Winnipeg, fly in. Yeah. So it's very lonely for them, for one thing, and mm -hmm. that's not right for. It's not good for the baby. No. <clears throat> no. We're we're all we we we're. we're very deeply entrenched in our families, you know, that, yeah. that's our roots. So, yeah. Okay. I, as, as the two of you speak, I kind of wish we could just sort of let you carry on and we'll just, we'll just <laughs> listen in as flies yeah. on the wall because clearly there's so much to, to yeah. learn in your conversation as you learn from one another. Thank mm -hmm. you. And Frida, if you are needing to, to leave, um, please, please, you know, uh, feel free to do that. But thank you so much for for You're joining welcome. us. Thank you for having me. Giving yeah. giving us your time. Yes. And for all your contributions um, yeah. Thank to, you for having to me. PWRDF Thank you very much. and the IPAC. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just, uh, but before we uh, wrap up, though, there are a couple of more questions. If Lisa, you're able to stay on. There's yeah. actually a question to PWRDF in here um, from Jen in, in Edmonton, I believe, about um, audits and PWRDF providing perhaps accountants for audits. Does it? Does anyone uh, will or someone else want to respond to that one? Um, <laughs> I, was that Jose's voice? I'll I'll just say something real quick. Uh, great question, and um, we're definitely going to look into it, Jen. If you're still here, I don't see all the folks here, but uh, definitely we want to look into that, and we definitely want to do that as part of how can we make. Uh, our support's easier at the application stage, support for audits. Maybe we can do some advocacy work around CRA registration. We've had these really good conversations last week and just make it easier uh, for Indigenous communities and organizations to respond as they best see fit. Frida, good idea to share hard copies, printed copies, so we don't need to rely on people who have to check our 
website if that's not so easily available. So all is yeah. good. Thank you. And yeah, and the very big one as well is that uh, tax tax number. Yeah, like our communities yeah. Just don't have that. Yeah, we're going to look into that for sure, Frida. Thank you. Thank you. I noticed um, Susan has just put in the, the chat. Uh, has PWRDF ever approached an accounting firm to see if they could provide audits on a pro bono basis? So that might mm. be something to worth to be worth exploring. Lisa, I, I neglected to thank you when you finished your um, your presentation. I and just I'm reminded of the um, both the length and the, the the deepness of the relationship that we um, have been fortunate to have with. Um, the Language and Learning Center and what we've we've learned from you through that. And so thank you so much for reminding us of that, the longevity of that relationship and its deepness. I noticed a question here for you, um, and I just need to find it again. There it is. Is there a computer keyboard or program for writing in Mohawk? Trying to remember what year it was. Uh, oh God, maybe two thousand. Maybe about two thousand four, two thousand five. Uh, I know our council was trying to do a deal with Microsoft, and that would cause a lot of controversy, and so it was shot down. Um. I think what people are always worried about is about uh, like copyright, you know, like rights. And that if you do something like that, it takes away or it could take away, you know, you, you, you no longer own. I know that our organization, our community had a deal with Rosetta Stone for a computer program that would allow you to learn our language. And unfortunately it's obsolete now because of, um, it doesn't work with anything beyond Windows 7, I believe. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't, as part of the contract, we couldn't do, do it the way the other languages did it because of that worry about the language, you know, and it no longer becoming ours, signing over the rights or whatnot. So we weren't, we didn't, we don't have the capacity now to be able to, to form, to, to keep it up. Um, you know, to keep it up and, and to keep progressing with it. And it's a lot of money to do ourselves. So we're looking at different ways. There's can eight. Some people though, you know, of course, you know, with technology, we have some indigenous people that are working on programming. I know there was one uh, guy, I can't remember where he's from, who received a grant to do, it was, I believe, uh, verbs maybe. It, it was this really intense, program um but that's really what i know you know rosetta stone and and that but for the typing no you it, it's more like language tools that you can use right and there's and quizlet too you know people sometimes some people use quizlet to uh, to learn okay but if the ch if the uh, if the children are in an immersion program mm -hmm. Do they write by hand then? What? Yeah. 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 Or they know how to write, like, right? I mean, I use a computer and I have to write things in our language and I just, it's, it's about the accents and you just, our, 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 our uh, language, our alphabet is 11 letters. Oh. Yeah. And our, our accents are critical to the language. You know, it, it's critical to how you say the word because it could, it could, you could say it one way and it means something completely different. And oh. most of the time, something funny. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I, when I took the program, it was a one year. Now it's a two year and it's completely, you know, grown and, and changed. I wish I took the two year because when you come out, you're really, really proficient. Uh, at the end of one year, you're just starting to hit a stride, starting to feel comfortable with the language. So, and then also, unfortunately, the reality is, is that once you're finished the program and you're not immersed in that, in, in that immersion setting anymore, you tend to, you know, regress a little bit. Um, but our language, when I hear people speak our language, 
I wish I could understand everything because when I watch our people speak, they're always laughing. There's a lot of joy in the language. There's a lot of laughter. There's a lot of stories. And I'm very close to this man. He's an old family friend. His name is Kenny Thompson and he's from Agwazasne. And he's 80, I think he just turned 86. And when he calls me, of course he speaks English. I have a hard time to hear him. Even when I'm with him face to face and I talk to him, he, I find he mumbles a lot. But when he speaks the language, cause we had, I went to visit him in Agwazasne. That's what I wanted to do for my birthday. I wanted to see him and have lunch with him. So my mother and I went, we're sitting in this restaurant in Agwazasne and this woman comes in and she happens to be from Agwazasne, but she always was in Ganawage and she actually was a teacher when I was a young girl. I mean, I mean young elementary school and her name's Bari Wahawe, and but she's from Agwazasne and she was the teacher of our first ever immersion program. Mm -hmm. Like already one in she was our teacher for that first two years. So she saw me and she knew my mother because my mother was a student of the first class. So, and actually in my family, my mother took it. She took that first year and then I took it in year four and one of my daughters took it as well. So that's three generations of my mm -hmm. family who took the program. So the woman comes to sit down with us to talk. Her name's Dori Wahami. She sits down next to Kenny. And then uh, they know my mother can speak, maybe not as well as them, but she can understand everything. So they start to talk in the language. And the minute they started to talk in Mohawk, Kenny's voice, his voice raised. You know what I mean? And I could hear, and I was like, you see the difference right away. You know, you see that difference right away. So it, it's so important in our language. It really is here. And when people start to understand it, you see those changes. You see it, you know, they become immersed in the, in the language and they wanna know the culture. They go hand in hand. So you might see somebody who attended church their whole lives, maybe were raised Catholic, but now they're going back to our longhouse and back to our ways. Then they're bringing their children. You know, that that's what happened to me too. I'm, I have three daughters and a granddaughter. And my girls were all baptized Catholic out of respect for their grandmothers. But in the end, I started to go to the longhouse and learn our ways, brought my daughters with me. And in the end, they chose to be named in the longhouse. Mm -hmm. So they're not Catholic anymore, they're traditional. And then my granddaughter was named in the longhouse. So that shift, you know, changed to where it's about our ways. So anyway, that's my, my little personal story. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I see we're past time. We started a bit late, but um, I love to keep going, but <laughs> mm -hmm. I think people are, are needing to leave. So. Um, I don't know, Will, if you wanted to say anything um, to end. I do have a very brief prayer to offer, and um, then I think we'll we'll uh, call it a day. Will? Sure, I can just repeat just so many uh, so many gratitudes, uh, Lisa, for our partnership. Um, we've learned so much, um, Lisa. Many, many thanks. Yeah, and uh, and Frida, if you're still on, and uh, I know you got a long trip ahead of you to Waboden, uh, a big out. thanks. Has she left? Okay, we're grateful to Frida as well. Uh, Frida, you know, has come from Waboden down to Winnipeg over to Six Nations of the Grand River and spent uh, just real quality time with us. So a whole lot of gratitude um, and gratitude, Suzanne and Janice and all who are setting this up, Jose, always good to work together uh, with you on something that's increasingly important, not just support for Indigenous programs, but just deepening our listening, deepening our learning, deepening our uh, our respect, and how we can take that to others of the work, uh, programs, partnerships of PWRDF all around the world. So a big thank you. Yeah, and um, we'll end in prayer uh, briefly. Uh, just want to say to you, Lisa, I, I'm, I'm conscious uh, in you thanking us that we really need to thank you and Frida and those that we seek to accompany for the gift that you give to us, and um, which is, is far greater than anything we can offer. So thank you. Let's finish with the Anglican Healing Fund prayer. Let us pray. Merciful God, 
you call us to loving relationship with one another. Be with us now as we seek to heal old wounds and find joy again in these relationships. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts of flesh. Give us the gifts of honesty and openness and fill us with your healing power and grace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, everyone. Happy summers to all, and we'll see you back, I hope, in September. Thank you very much, Susan, Jonas, everyone. Well, Wana. All the best, Lisa. Wana. 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 Yeah. <laughs>